Okay, what's up everybody? So what we have today is one of these, again, a qualitative quantitative type questions. I want us to start kind of seeing these early on so we get used to what they're gonna look like. Um, so last time we had one of these, we were looking at a situation where, actually I don't remember what we were looking at. I had a different one in AP2 where students were making claims and we had to justify those claims. Um, so I don't remember what the last one we looked at here, but hey, you know what, that's okay. So we're looking at another type of qualitative quantitative question today. And this one, I think we may have done it already, um, but now we can see, hey, that these qualitative quantitative questions are kind of important. So we wanna make sure that we put a focus and kind of get used to what they could be asking us on this modified AP test. So when we're looking at this one, we're saying this problem explores how the relative masses of two blocks affect the acceleration of the blocks. Block A of mass, mass A, that's supposed to be an underscore, but I can't do that in Google Forms, rests on a horizontal tabletop. There is negligible friction between block A and the tabletop. Block B of mass MB hangs from a light string that runs over a pulley and attaches to block A as shown below. My bad. <laughs> the pulley has negligible mass and spins with negligible friction about its axle. The blocks are released from rest. So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, suppose the mass of block A is much greater than the mass of block B. And they ask us to estimate a number for the acceleration of the blocks. So we know that this number, our range, will pretty much be between 0 and 9.8. If we're just dealing with things falling, we're not going to go over 9.8. That would be weird unless we have something like forcing it down. Um, but we don't really have that in this case. So what I'm going to do right now, what we have to do is think about it more qualitatively. We're not really doing any equations. We're not doing any numbers. But I still want to think about my situation. I still want to, I'm being asked about the situation. I'm being asked about the acceleration. So I want to assess something regarding the acceleration before I start. So what I want to think about is I'm just going to kind of come in here and do my force diagram for block A and for block B. But for block A, it looks like, okay, we have a contact force from this string, so we know we have this tension. We have the gravitational force, and we have the normal force for block B. Our only contact force is this tension. And we know these tensions are equal to each other. So, oh, that wasn't the tension that I did. This is the tension. So we know those are equal to each other. So what we're looking at here is block A is really, really big. So block A has a large mass. So this mass of A is large. And we're being pulled by the same block B. So what's nice is we can just kind of think about this as a qualitative situation. If we envision this where we're saying, oh, well, maybe we can think about having a very large block here like a really, really heavy, 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 heavy block, and then something just kind of casually pulling it down. It looks like tension is gonna be the force that makes it accelerate. So the tension is throughout this rope, and if we picture something really, really big with just this tension force acting on it, it'll probably have a very low acceleration. I would say that the acceleration is close to zero, So uh, they want a number, so I'll call it about one meter per second squared. I'd say it's something pretty low. Because we have a lot of mass here, and then here we're asking to explain it without deriving or using equations, we can say Newton's second law. So maybe I'll even type it. Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. If mass A is large, then it will have a low acceleration. And one thing that we're going to have to specify is that changing the mass of A doesn't change the force on A. So soon we're going to look at block B and we're going to say, okay, if we increase the mass of block B, 
we're kind of increasing the net force on our system. We're increasing this net force. But when we increase the mass of A, the only force that we're changing is Fg and Fn. But those two, those aren't causing the acceleration of our system, right? Our block is accelerating to the right and increasing the mass of block A is only changing stuff about our gravitational force and then by default, our normal force, which is already balanced. It doesn't change anything about the acceleration of our system. So without being too mathy, how do I get back to pegging? All right, so we can say increasing the mass of block A doesn't change the net force acting on block A. The net force is still coming from the tension, which is controlled by block B. Um, so then we can say just a quick little something about if we increase the mass of block A, we are only influencing the gravitational force and the normal force, which are balanced, so have no control over the acceleration of mass A. Yeah, so, um, so I'll say which are balanced and in the vertical direction. which is in the horizontal. Okay, so really quickly, I'm just gonna pause up and then check the key, see uh, what they say for their answer. But this feels like a pretty decent explanation. Okay, so their official explanation, we say, okay, we can get two points out of this. Um, one point for saying that we have a correct answer with a consistent justification, so something saying like, hey, we said that it's going to be a small number, so then something that argues saying, yeah, it'll be small because if we had said, oh, the acceleration is small, and then argued for why the acceleration would be big, we wouldn't get the point, but we did that, and then having correct reasoning. So their example is a lot shorter than ours, but you know what? That's okay. So they're saying, hey, nearly zero, so we said that close to zero. And then they're saying very small, block A has a large inertia, so it won't speed up as much, close to zero because block B is so light that it can hardly budge block A. So we said something about the tension force coming from block B. Um, but yeah, so kind of this idea that B is a small force, or small mass, so it's supplying a small force that doesn't really influence block A. Then they set up a claim evidence reasoning type answer, which is totally okay to do, as long as it's consistent, as long as you kind of voice your reasoning. We say acceleration is small, mass of block A is much greater than the mass of block B. So because of that, um, it has a large inertia, won't speed up as much. Yeah, so that is an answer for that one. A little bit simpler, but you know what? Any way works. So now we're looking at AII. Now suppose the mass of block A is much less than the mass of block B. Estimate the magnitude of the acceleration of the blocks after release. So we're saying now block A is very, very small. And block, or sorry, yeah, block A is small and block B is just its good old self. So I would say that the acceleration will be closer to 9.8 meters per second squared. It's going to be close to as if it were just falling. I don't know, fall, maybe like nine meters per second squared if they want an actual number. Cool, and now uh, briefly explain your reasoning without deriving or using equations. So if we're looking at this situation, if block A is small, then this tension is kind of this, um, this combination between these two. So we have the force of tension holding block B up, and we have this force of tension that's pulling block A. So if we're saying that this is very small, we're going to have less resistance to this block B. We'll have less of a net force acting on it because we'll have less of this upwards force. And then block B will be able to accelerate quickly, more closer to as if it was just in free fall. 
So let's try to put that into words. This is for like. Okay. I can say. Maybe set up a claim evidence reasoning type response like they did. Block these acceleration will be close to 9.8 meters per second. Stroke. This is due to Newton's second law. So the tension. Or so we'll say the net, sorry, the acceleration of an object is directly related to the net force acting on an object. If the mass of block A is small, then the tension force in the rope is also small. This means that the upwards force acting on block B is very small, leaving just the gravitational force. The net force on block B is close to just the gravitational force, which means that the Acceleration is close to 9.8 meters per second squared. Like if the block were in free fall. All right, so that's kind of again a lengthier explanation, but pretty much us arguing from Newton's second law that if the net force acting on an object is pretty much just the gravitational force, then it will have an acceleration of just g. Um, so that was my explanation. Let's see what they said. Probably something simpler. They know how to make them short and concise. All right, so let's see, nearly equal to G because the block is almost in free fall. Hey, um, because block A is negligible mass and the tension of the string is nearly zero. Acceleration is close to G. The mass of block A is much less than the mass of block B. The negligible friction between block A and the tabletop. Oh, there it is. Um, and the pulley is negligible mass and spins with negligible friction about its axle, nearly equal to G because block B is almost in free fall or 10 meters per second squared because the block A has a negligible mass and the tension in the string is nearly zero. Cool. Okay. Now we're looking at this one. I saw that you can add stickers in this. Um, so I have a sticker of two snakes or eels that are high-fiving each other, and I thought that was kind of fun. Um, here's a bird. So let's run around with that, because why not? All right, um, now suppose that neither block's mass is much greater than the other, but that they are not necessarily equal. The dots below represent block A and block B, as indicated by the labels. Replicate the dots on a piece of paper. On a, each dot, draw and label the forces that are exerted on the block after release. Represent each force by a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. So we did this up there, so I'm not going to go through the process again. But so we have our gravitational force for A acting downwards. We have our normal force acting upwards. Let me get to these. Then there's the tension force, but I just want to get to these when the ruler is still good. We have force of gravity of B. And we have the tension force acting up on B. And again, I did this up there earlier, so I'm not going to go through it again. Yeah, so there we go. Now what we're doing is derive, oh, I'm gonna have to move my toucan. That's a damn shame. Okay, so then we're saying derive an equation for the acceleration of the blocks after release in terms of mass A, mass B, and physical constants as appropriate. If you need to draw anything other than what you've shown, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what we're doing here is just deriving an equation. 
So we can write Newton's second law for both of these situations. And I'm just going to come over here. So I can write Newton's second law for block A. And I can use Newton's second law for block B. So what I'm going to do really quickly before I start is just kind of make a little mental note to myself that says, hey, this block is accelerating to the right, and this block will be accelerating downward. And that's because we don't have any friction, so nothing is holding, bla bla nothing is holding back this block A, so it has to accelerate in the direction of its net force. Because these things are a system, they're going to have to accelerate together. They're connected by that rope. So if this thing's accelerating this way, we have the pulley to redirect the direction of our force. So that means that block B is going to be accelerating downwards. So let's start off with block B. We say, OK, if I'm using Newton's second law, this sum of forces equals mass times acceleration, I can say I have a positive force of tension minus a force of gravity equals my mass times my acceleration. And what I'm going to say is this is a negative acceleration. We just said, hey, this is accelerating in what we're calling the negative direction. So our block B has a negative acceleration. And then what they want our answer, and they want it in terms of just the mass. So I'm going to rewrite my gravitational force as mb times g. Cool. All right, now I can look at this one, this block A. For block A, if I'm looking in the x direction, I can say, OK, my force of tension is the only thing acting in the x direction equals mass A times the acceleration. Again, these things are accelerating together. They're connected, so they have the same acceleration. So we can just call that A. The tension is the same. It's the same rope, so we can just call that FT. OK, so now if we're looking at this, we want an equation for A in terms of MA and in terms of MB. So if we're looking at this, we're allowed to use MA. We can't use this FT. And we want to solve for this A. We can't use that FT. So we kind of have to move some things around so we can just get A. So I want to get rid of this FT. So it's going to be nice if I can just sub in this force of tension. I can say the force of tension is equal to MA times acceleration. Over here, I have force of tension. So I can say, hey, this is what my force of tension is equal to. It's equal to MA times acceleration and do a little substitution there. All right, and then I want to solve for A, so I can move some things around. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add this MBA to both sides. So MA times A plus MB times A. And then I'm going to add this MBG to both sides equals M, B, G. So then I want to solve for A, so I'm just going to do a little bit of algebra here. I say, hey, these are both multiplied by A, so I'm going to do a little bit of that. I'm going to uh, factor that out. And then divide and say M, B, G over And now I have an equation for the acceleration in terms of the masses and physical constants as appropriate. Cool. And this equation, I don't have any of my eels, but that's okay. There we go. This equation is huge because it's going to guide us for the rest of it. So that was kind of our qualitative stuff stopped here. Moving on down, now we're looking at more quantitative situations. So the quantitative situations now, moving forward, are going to ask us to use this equation. So consider the scenario from part AII where the mass of block A is much less than the mass of block B. Does your equation for the acceleration of the blocks from part C agree with your reasoning in part A? So here, we're looking at what we did before. And this is kind of a cool part where we're saying, hey, this was qualitative. Um, what happened quantitatively? What if we do look at this quantitatively? So we're saying part ii, where the mass of A is much less than the mass of block B. We said we think that when mass A is small, we predicted that the acceleration would be large. I don't know why I drew an arrow. So 
So let's see. Let's see if that checks out. So if the mass of A is really, really small, we can even say if we've done some calculus things, we can say maybe let's say that this is like a limit approaching zero kilograms. So let's maybe even pretend that it's so small, it's so like really, 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 really small that we can say it's pretty much zero. Let's pretend that's 0 0.00000000001 kilograms. You wouldn't even feel that. That's like a little piece of dust. So it's so small, let's not even include it in our equation. So we said our acceleration is mb times g over, we're saying ma is so small, we're just going to call it zero plus mb. And we know that zero plus anything is just equal to mb, or just equal to itself. And let's see, if we do that math, we say, oh, well, a is equal to mbg over mb. I can cancel this out. Oh, a is just equal to g. So in a situation where ma is really, really small, our acceleration is pretty much just g. So that checks out. We said that a was large, and we said that we thought that it would be pretty much 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's what we saw here. So yeah. Um, that whole explanation is kind of what I just did. Um, but so briefly explain your reasoning. Um, so yeah, so we're going to say as mass A goes to zero, the denominator goes to MB. When we cancel out MB in the numerator, Our acceleration is equal to g. Um, it's not a great explanation. I feel like I verbalized a better definition. Um, but yeah, so that's an explanation. Let's see what they have. <laughs> so they're saying, ooh, they have a lot of explanations. So they have the same equation. Um, one answer for yes, if it's acceptable. Equation for the acceleration agrees with the reasoning. Much less. When MA is much less than MB, it can be neglected in the equation derived in part C, giving an acceleration close to G as stated. Hey, nice. Oh, that's kind of what we said. Okay, dope. And then you can still get points even if you got it wrong. Okay, and then one little thing too that we can look at is it's not asked, but we can still do it. So we said um, we said earlier that if ma was really really big, then our acceleration would be close to zero. This one's not as important because it's a little bit more abstract. Um, but so what we can say is, okay, if MA is really, really big, so if MA is approaching infinity, we're doing some limits, if it's approaching infinity, then we essentially have A is equal to like 1 over infinity, which is like kind of like 0. If we take 1 over a really, really, if we divide by a really, 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 really big number, pretty much like having zero. If you have a piece of pizza and you say, hey, I want to divide it against my uh, one billion closest friends, pretty much everybody gets a small amount. Pretty much everybody gets close to zero. Um, it's kind of a kindergarten-y way of thinking about it, but you get the idea, you get the gist. So yeah, so that checks out too. If MA is really, really big, our acceleration approach is zero. Okay, and then finally, while the blocks are accelerating, the tension in the vertical portion of the string is T1. Next, the pulley of negligible mass is replaced with a second pulley whose mass is not negligible. When the blocks are accelerating the scenario, the tension in the vertical portion of the string is T2. How do the tensions compare to each other? So before what we had was this nice situation Where we're saying, okay, or we're falling, we have a tension of T1 throughout, 
and this has pretty much no mass that it's not really, we can think of it as not accelerating, we can think of it as not moving. So there's a lot of different ways that we can approach this. Um, one way that I'm going to think about it is through energy. So what we're saying, or maybe, maybe energy is not the best route, but all right, so yeah, so energy is an okay way to think about this. So before, we can pretty much say, hey, this wheel, it's so small, it's barely part of our system. Excuse me. So it's barely part of our system, we barely have to consider it. Yeah, it's going to be spinning, but if we want to think about its rotational kinetic energy, this is one half i omega squared, where i is based on the mass, saying, hey, this mass is so small that the kinetic energy is pretty much zero. In this case, what we can think about is we start off with some amount of energy in our system. Before, if we're looking just at this block, we're saying, hey, we're kind of doing work on this block, and we're giving it its energy is going from, so if we think about before, we have all the energy stored kind of in UG over here in our system and then our energy turns into fully kinetic by the time we reach the lowest. So we go, hey, straight from UG because of this stored energy. Then we go to kinetic. This is in our first situation. In our second situation, we can say, hey, like this time, yeah, we start out with potential, but now our wheel has mass. So we're going to kinetic and we're also going to kinetic rotational because this wheel now has this kinetic rotational energy. It's spinning and now it's kind of a part of our system we have to think about. So before we can say, hey, this thing sped up the block, it gained kinetic energy at a larger rate than in situation two. So it gained, gained K at a faster rate. And kinetic energy is based on the velocity. So really what we're saying is it gained a velocity at a quicker rate. And the rate that something changes velocity is just the acceleration. So here in this situation two, we have a lower velocity change rate. Or as we usually call it, this one has a lower acceleration. So we have a smaller acceleration in this case. So we have a smaller acceleration. We know that, but that doesn't quite tell us anything about the tensions yet. So let's really quickly think about this block B. So we know that block B, we have this gravitational force down, we have this tension force up. So we can write out our Newton's second law and say, um, I'm gonna call it T2, because that's what we're dealing with here, T2 minus MBG is equal to negative mb times a. So in this case, we have a smaller negative acceleration. We have a smaller acceleration. So our term over here is smaller, which means, and maybe if we move this around a little bit to make it simpler for us, So if this term is smaller, or we said in our second time, maybe I'll even call this A2. If this term is small, then we're going to have a larger tension. If we kind of put numbers to it, let's say maybe this um, gravitational force, this mg, is, let's maybe call it 10. If our acceleration is smaller, maybe in case 1 it was 5 mb times a is equal to 5 maybe. And then in our second case, if we have a smaller thing, we're taking away less. So that means that we're left with a greater number on this side. So our T2 is greater than T1. This is kind of like a T1 situation, kind of a T2 situation. So yeah, so because we have a lower acceleration, a smaller A, greater T2, And then we talk about the net force. 
blah, 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 blah. Just like we did down there. But yeah, so really quickly, we'll check to see what they said. Um, there's College Board's answer is saying um, T2 is greater than T1, one point for getting it correct. Um, the acceleration of both blocks is smaller for doing any of the following, whatever that's consistent. Smaller acceleration implies that T2 is greater than T1. We said that. And then that is if you didn't get it correct. Um, yeah, so the pulley spins with a negligible friction about the axle. The original pulley has negligible mass. The second pulley's mass is not negligible. The rotational inertia of the second pulley results in a smaller acceleration for the blocks. Block B must have a smaller net force to have a smaller acceleration. So the rope tension must be greater than before. Such a magnitude to the gravitational force on block B. So that is a quantitative qualitative question. We were doing a lot of mathematical things and talking about them. So I like this one because a lot of it is we go from qualitative to quantitative. I like this one because we go from quantitative to qualitative, especially when we have that equation where we said, hey, um, we have this equation for the acceleration. What happens with it? Let's explain this. Let's think about the limits to this. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a good question. And yeah, that's kind of what we got for the day. Hope you have a good weekend.